Um, I started doing Dimernomics in 2011, and the big reason why was January of 2007, I called that we were going to go into a major recession. It's the recession everybody remembers and feels all the pain from. Uh, you know, housing in Denver went down 25%, housing in Aurora went down 60%. We had bottom November of 2010. And basically what happened was everybody started calling me. Is this it? Is this it? When is the next big recession going to happen? And we, and we will and have had little baby recessions along the way. But I think everybody's concerned right now with everything and the state of the market and what's happening with interest rates and what's happening with inflation. There's more um, concern right now, I think, than ever before. Uh, you know, it's funny, in two, I think 2008 hit us like a ton of bricks. Everybody's like, how could this happen? But if you actually just focus on the data, data will show you everything of like what you need to do with your finances, how you need to invest, everything else. So, and that's what I geek out on because I love numbers. So that's Dimmernomics. Um, so what I do with Dimmernomics is I start from like a macroeconomic global perspective because we are global. You know, the internet and everything else has changed the way we used to be, we used to be very micro, and now it's everything impacts us. Ukraine impacts us, Russia impacts us, China impacts us. Um, so we'll go over what's happening globally, uh, what factors are contributing to housing decisions, what, what is causing property to increase, right? We have 20% increase in the, you know, last year. That's insane, mm -hmm. right? Um, what does Denver Real Estate Inventory look like right now, and what does the future of Denver Real Estate look like? So agenda is going to be global, then we'll do U.S., and then we're going to do Denver Metro. So global. So the interesting thing about the interest rates rising is the United States is the worst country for debt and how much money the government requires from taxes to actually pay on our debt. So over 15% of our GDP, which is our gross domestic production for America, and we are actually the largest GDP in the whole world, um, but over 15% of every dollar that comes in actually goes to pay uh, debt. And, and it, so you, you think about that, for every $100 you give the government, almost $16 is going just to pay the interest on the debt to other countries. So world economic outlook growth projections. So this is global, this is everybody. Advanced economies are uh, first world, right? First world problems, America, we're first world. <coughs> Emerging markets and developing economies, Mexico, India, you know, any, any non-first world countries. And what you'll notice is in 2021, we were all really high as far as growth. And if you think about that, that was a direct relation to COVID. So everything shut down 2020. You think about it, restaurants weren't open. We couldn't go out. We weren't even allowed to see people. And so what happened was the people that were able to keep their jobs continued working at home. They weren't spending money. And they basically saved up money. So when 2021 hit and people were vaccinated and people felt safe to leave, we had a just an explosion of people spending money. And so if you look at that, like global 6.1, America's like 5.2, emerging markets 6.8, and then it goes down. But the difference is, is this is still a positive number. We are still producing at a high rate. Um, globally, we're at 3.6 for 2022. Um, first world countries are at 3.3. Emerging markets are at 3.8. Um, and then what you're going to see is this is going to, global is going to stay pretty consistent to next year. We go down a little bit in America as far as what we are going to be, as far as what we're going to be increasing. A lot of that's a direct rel a relationship to interest rates. So the Fed is increasing interest rates in order to taper down uh, basically all the inflation that we're having. Uh, it is working to a degree but that is going to stop how much growth we can have. But I think it's interesting if you look at emerging markets, 
We're at 3.8, it's going to go up to 4.4. That's also a direct relationship to the Fed and interest rates because what's going to happen is if we can go to third world countries and get items for less and the labor's cheaper, it's going to grow more than America. So right now, every, so these are all the different, and this is current, this is in real today's time. So non-residential non construction. I think this is super interesting. What is non-residential construction? Didn't everybody think office buildings were just going to go away after COVID, right? They're not. Office buildings are at the very beginning and are going to start rising incredibly. They're in phase A. Um, right now, we're peaking with consumer prices, wholesale trade, production, retail is at a peak. Um, the housing, we're actually softened, and that's a direct relationship to interest rates. We are no longer at the peak. We were at the peak in March for housing. Um, financial sector. So there's one of two ways that all of this can go. And this is why we have the Fed, and this is why we have Powell, and that's why you see the article, like, headlines, right? Um, it's either a soft landing or a hard landing. 2008, 2009, that was a hard landing, right? That was painful for a lot of people. A lot of people lost their homes. It was sad. It was a ton of short sales. Um, as far as what I see, this is going to be a nice soft landing, and we will be going right back up next year. Uh, we are in, if, if you paid attention at all in like 2018, I was telling everybody, <clears throat> The 2020 to 2030 is going to be a really tumultuous market. It's going to be very difficult for a lot of different reasons. This is kind of part of it, but what you're going to see about the trends lines is all of this is going to start happening a lot faster. We're going to have a lot more ups and downs, and they're going to be quick as far as speedy, right? Where, where something's going to be really bad for three months. Take our stock market right now, right? Um, stock market nobody's real happy with. Uh, I will tell you, and I'll put, I'll bet every person in this room, $5 that by the end of the year, the s and will be all new highs. Will be what, say that again? All new what? Highs. Highs, yeah. So the causes to recession, obviously the Ukraine, Russia, I mean, it's horrific what's happening. It's not good for the economy. It's not good for supply. Um, and so this is a problem. Uh, we can all we all know what I hope happens to Putin. So uh, we have that. We also have energy wars. That's a real life thing. That's also a, a relation with Russia. So U.S. is actually number one in producing oil. Um, and so that's good. But then you have to look at number two, which is Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia is pretty icy. I know uh, Biden's there right now, but Saudi Arabia hasn't liked America too much, and they're number two. And then, uh, you know, refineries and whatnot, that's all getting stopped, locked down because of the Ukraine-Russia issue. Um, and then the rising interest rates. You know, if you think about rising interest rates, if you were to borrow $500,000, every time interest rates increase one point, the difference is $386 a month. So if interest rates have gone up two points and you're getting a $500,000 loan, um, you know, I mean, we're talking 700 bucks more a month. It's significant. But that's what's actually slowing down the housing market. So my long-term concerns, I, again, if you've been coming to my Demonomics, you'll know I still think 2030 is the marker in the sand. I think 2030 is when we're going to hit a brick wall. Um, this decade is going to be tumultuous as far as ups and downs, but what you don't want to be sitting in is a lot of cash. So we're gonna still have a lot of inflation. There's a lot of room to grow. Um, you want to get invested into hard assets. Uh, right now, stock market's completely on sale. I'm pro, uh, I, I, and, but not like random stocks. I think the best thing to do is invest in the S&P. Um, it'll give you the whole broad range of the QQQ. Uh, just, you wanna take a macro level of all the companies and, and, and when things go up in general, the S&P always beats picking out single stocks. Um, our mortgage and finance system, I think we're going to see a lot of changes with that. I think we're going to end up going to smart contracts uh, no later than 2028. Um, we have a new axis of evil. 
if you know anything about me, you know I was in Germany when the wall came down. Uh, my father fought Russia, ended the Cold War. Never thought I'd be up here talking about the new axis of evil. I thought that would happen after I died. Um, but it's true, we have a new axis of evil. Uh, China's actually playing it pretty well. They're, I'm shocked they haven't run into Taiwan, but if you follow uh, Chinese markets, China's really looking at Putin going, wow, I thought that would go better. And China realizes that they're way too dependent on our exports and our imports to piss us off. So I think the China-Thailand thing is not as much of an issue, even though when you read headlines, remember the headlines are there to sell you ads. And in general, what you want to do is the exact opposite of whatever the news is telling you to do. So um, Iran, China, Russia, they're, they're all together. Uh, they all like each other. Um, and it's something long-term we should be concerned about and should be watching. Uh, the deficit spending, you know, when we're spending over 15% of all of our income just paying interest, we need to be worried about our deficit. We can't just have our government spending. The bigger the government gets, the smaller the person gets. So that's just something everybody needs to recognize. And then income inequality. This is going to be a huge issue, and this is a huge issue that happened with the pandemic. Government came in and said, all of you people can't work. You all get to sit at home, and I'm going to write you checks. And they and they weren't able to produce. And what has occurred now? Interest rates are going up. People that don't have a lot of money, they're not able to buy homes. It's the number one vehicle in order to create wealth in America. And people who are not doing well or don't have hard assets have been left in the dust. And our inequality uh, in America is higher than it's ever been in 50 years. So, um, recessions are caused by monetary policy tightening. That's what's happening right now. That's the Fed going, we're going to fix inflation, we're going to increase interest rates. Overborrowing, heavy investments, fiscal policy shocks. Fiscal policy shocks were COVID, right? Um, Russia decides to release a nuclear bomb, uh, anything like that. And uh, financial sector dysfunction. There's a lot of dysfunction right now within companies and also how the media is portraying the companies. Um, and so you're seeing big drops. But if you look at like core um, companies like Apple or Google or Microsoft, I mean, these are companies we really can't live without. And I absolutely believe that they are on sale. So energy crisis. I'm going to miss bunch of things I'm supposed to tell you. So, I already told you, America's number one in producing Russia, or in producing oil, Russia's number two, number three is Saudi Arabia. Then you have to ask yourself though, just because you produce oil, oil has to be refined in order to actually go into the vehicles and go into the machinery that farms and everything else. So who's refining? It's India, South Korea, Venezuela and Singapore, and that should scare every single one of you. So, potential problems and real problems, right? Ukraine and Russia crisis. Russia decides we want Ukraine. Half of Ukraine actually believed that um, they were excited that Putin was coming. I have Ukrainian clients. They didn't understand the reality of what was going to happen. A lot of people actually don't even understand right now what happened. So Russia came in and they blew up all of Ukraine's satellites. And so their goal was to come in and take over Ukraine and not let the world know. So what happened was Zelensky called Elon Musk and he said, Elon, will you please help us? Russia is coming in and taking over and there's rape and there's murder and executions and the world needs to know what's happening. And Elon Musk actually took his satellites and put it over Ukraine. And the only reason we know what's happening is because Elon Musk moved his satellites over. They would not have the ability to get all the information out that we would receive. Food shortages. This is a much bigger deal, and I've got, I've got actually quite a bit of info on the food shortages um, that we'll talk about further on. But Bank of America, uh, the Bank of America analysts said that they expect U.S. food inflation to hit 9% higher by the end of 2022. 
So if you paid a hundred dollars for, or if you paid one dollar for a gallon of milk, it'll be one oh nine. It's significant, and it affects people. Well, it affects all of us, but it really affects people who are on a really tight budget. Um, raising prices like bread, milk, meat should continue uh, this year, uh, especially as Russia and Ukraine conflict continues. You have to realize Ukraine was a breadbasket for Europe. Um, wheat, there's a reason why you're paying double for pasta. Uh, you know, buy some flour for sure. <laughs> Um, but you, uh, Ukraine was the biggest uh, breadbasket for steel, coal, fuel, and grains like barley, corn, and wheat. And what should really freak you out about the corn is that's one of the reasons why we're going to have such food issues. Our farmers are literally selling their farms to developers because they cannot afford to feed their animals. Hay went from $55 for a bushel to 80 I mean, these are significant price increases that literally take out the farmer. Um, baby formula. We know this because Jill's pregnant, and it's super scary. We don't have enough baby formula. We told people to stop working. We closed down, uh, you know, manufacturing sites, and now we literally have children that do not have formula, and that's zero to twelve months. It's incredibly important time to get proper nutrition. This is going to come back and bite us so hard in like 12 to 15 years. Because what's going to end up happening is the people who are not able to get hold of the formula, they are making the form that they're making their own, which is a whole other issue. Um, they're borrowing and they're spreading it thin. And so what we're going to end up having is a large population of children that are not going to get enough nutrition in order for their brains to completely develop. And we are going to feel this baby formula, I mean, pretty hard, like, in, in 15 years, which will be just perfect, it'll be, it'll be the very brand new beginning of, of basically the new world order starting because we're going to hit rock bottom in 2036. Um, Sweden and Finland did something interesting. These guys have been neutral forever. They're like, no, 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 we don't want to do anything. But because Russia went into Ukraine, Sweden and Finland are now joining NATO. That doesn't make Putin very happy, um, but you know they've realized that if you want NATO and you want the protection of NATO, then you need to, um, you 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 really need NATO at this point. We all have to make our decisions on which side we want to be on, and it's just weird that I'm saying that. So, United States, where are we? This is super interesting. So these are, in America, our raw active listings. We were higher in 2019, we got a little lower in 2020, we got a little lower in 2021, and we're even lower in 2022. So while you may feel like there's a little bit more on the market, it's really because there's less buyers, because they can't afford it, but there's even less housing and supply uh, which is a problem. You did this twice. I have a twice. Sorry, guys. Uh, state by state GDP. Um, Colorado is doing pretty good. We're keeping up with Texas, which is great because lots of companies are moving there because they're business friendly. California, um, Nevada, they're they're doing great. Um, Oregon's doing great. Uh, so it's interesting to see like this is kind of our central, like where our farmers are. Right? They're hurting. Uh, but this is just our over GDP for America. And um, we're, we're still doing well. Colorado's doing really well. I think one of the interesting things is when you're looking at all of this, like um, although California has a ton of people leaving, it's also you have to look at populations. The populations where people are leaving is where the GDP is declining. And Alaska's really unlikely. So, um, inflation is at a 40 year high. So, the, the following facts make it that likely that consumers can manage the inflation and still drive the economy to new heights in 2022 and 2023. So, it took me a couple of months to actually get all of this prepared. I read everything under the sun, all the numbers. Okay. 
um, all the numbers I could possibly get. And basically what it's breaking down to is our consumers have a surplus of money. Our personal debt is actually quite low. People are still wanting to spend money. Um, they have money to spend and they want experiences because they were cooped up for too long. Our debt to income ratios in America are very low. Um, so what that basically suggests is that consumers can borrow quite a bit more money before we get in trouble. And uh, the leading indicators are uh, declining signal, signal, uh, signaling that supply chain woes and inflationary pressures will likely ease. They are going to ease for certain sectors. There are things that are going to get better and there are some things that are going to get worse. So if you look at year over year, this is consumer price index. And one of the things you have to be careful about with consumer price index is the government will just sit there and change. So like one year they'll go, let's price out filet mignon. And then the next year, instead of using filet mignon, they'll go, wow, that's really expensive. Well, now let's do ground beef. And then now let's do, and so they kind of ship things in order for consumers to think that it's better than it really is. Um, but it did ease a bit in April, went from, uh, went to 8.3%, so down 0.2% month over month, which was the first decline we've had since August of 21st, um, even though it was tiny. Uh, so the core inflation, which excludes food and energy, um, slid from 6.5 to 6.2. Uh, so, but food and energy is, I think, the things we all should be a little bit more worried about right now. And I think, honestly, we all probably are. We feel it at the grocery store. We feel it at the pump. Um, I do think that inflation has peaked because of the rising interest rates, um, but it's not going to decline very quickly. I still think we have a long road of inflation. So, um, the risk of recession. It's a uh, higher inflation and higher interest rates are always precursors to recessions, right? And that's kind of where we're at, right? We have high inflation and we have high interest rates. Um, but I'll go out on a limb. I actually don't want to go into a recession. I think our second half of this year is going to be stronger than our first half. And uh, if we do end up having a recession, because you have to ask yourself, what is a recession? Um, that's two GDPs going down, right, like our GDP, our gross domestic, gross domestic production is going down. And while our first quarter was down, you, they compared our first quarter to the fourth quarter of 2021, which was like an explosion. We were all freaked out that we weren't going to have anything for Christmas, right? Like we were all driving around, we were looking for stuff, we were like hoarding things. I mean, fourth quarter of last year was crazy. I mean, we, we went and spent and bought and we were all in. Um, and basically what happened was first quarter of this year was less than fourth quarter of last year, but compared to third quarter of last year, we were up. So the, the, the data actually supports that even if our GDP goes less than first quarter, this second quarter, it's, it's, it's really going to be technical. We're not going to feel it. This is not 2008. This is not 2009. Not even close. One thing to realize, too, is the last five recessions we had in Colorado, housing only went down once. So just because we have a recession does not mean assets are going down. I don't see assets going down. So um, gasoline prices. Uh, it's not getting any better. Um, how painful is it? It's painful. Like we all feel it at the pump, right? It, it's far more expensive. We're spending twice as much. Um, the the gas sales stations uh, this spring presented nine point four four percent of overall of all retail sales, and so that's three point six one percent of the U.S.'s total personal income they're spending on gas. Uh, both percentages are higher than the historical instances, um, but at, at the end of the day, while gas is starting to eat up a bit more of our spending and income than average, we aren't even close to uh, the unprecedented territory when it comes to how much we are spending on gas rel relative to our overall consumption. 
So like in the 70s where interest rates were really, really high, gas was really high, but how much money each person had was so low, they were spending like 25% of their, their, their free money on gas, and we're not even anywhere close to that. Um, so, which is good, but it doesn't help. It, at, since America produces, we're the number one producer of oil, we need to work on our refinery. We need to be able to produce more, have to export less, or yeah, export more, import less, and, and, and be able to be functioning and we need to be energy dependent, and we are not. Um, so people are like, okay, great, we don't think there's going to be a recession. I follow disposable income, I follow gas prices, I follow inventory, I follow government spending, I follow trade deficit, I uh, follow cable. Cable is really interesting. Who's actually employed? And they keep talking about how low our employment is, but you have to think about this. If you haven't worked for six months, they don't even consider you labor anymore. So how many people do you know that lost their job in hospitality or whatever and have not gotten new jobs? We actually have a lot of labor that's sitting on the sidelines and is not being accounted for. It's not as scary as one would think. Um, mortgage application submissions actually increased uh, ending uh, May 6th. Uh, it, it increased 2%, but the refinance fell 2%. We're going to see a lot of lenders hurting because, you know, lenders were hanging out with refinances. I mean, if you're lucky, it was only 25% of your portfolio, but you're not going to see refinances coming back. Um, you know, the interest rate you got, I'm sure, is better than anything you can get right now. Um, and so uh, inflation also decelerated a little bit in April. And uh, continuing jobless claims dropped to the level of 1.34 million during the uh, end of April. Uh, so it's pretty much unchanged uh, through May. So United States and our debt. No, I'll be here. So uh, debt's interesting, right? One thing you have to look at is our trade deficit is imbalanced. Our trade deficit means if it were balanced, it means our exports would equal our imports. So when America makes things and we have more than we need, we export it to other countries. When we don't make what we need, we have to import it. America, though, is still the number one country for exports. We export $179 billion. Um, it's good. Uh, and that was, let me preface that. We exported $179 billion last month. So America's actually doing really well. And then you have to ask yourself, who does America sell to? Everybody thinks China. No. Number one country. Poll. Mexico. Mexico. No. Canada. Canada. Yes. Canada is our number one country that we export goods to. And that's not a bad thing. It's within North America. Um, and, and we're friendly, which is good. Number two country. Mexico. Europe. So we export to Europe. Number three is Mexico. What are we exporting? Just food products? Uh, we, uh, we have a plethora of items. I mean, you know, we are, technology is huge. Um, we do export food. Um, that would be a great, I will make that my next slide of the top 10 things that we export. But America actually makes a lot of goods at 179 billion dollars for cars, planes, um, military, weapons, defense. Uh, so if our number fourth country we export is actually to China. So I thought that would be, I thought would be, I think that'd be interesting. And exports are at a record high. And that's a good thing, because one thing you have to realize with economies is doesn't matter who's in the White House, doesn't matter. What matters is, you and me, are we spending money? Are we sitting in our houses collecting money and not spending anything? Or are we going out and supporting the economy? Because 70% of our economy is consumer spending. So the fact that our exports are high tell you that in other countries, they also are, they, they are buying. People are not held up in their houses, they're ready for an experience, and they're spending money. So the economy is actually pretty bright. Um, 
you pull up your news feed, you won't think that. But uh, the economy is actually pretty bright, and I'm not planning on a recession. Um, what I am planning on is a shorter rate of rise, meaning housing went up 20% over the last 12 months. We're not going to see that this year, but we will see everything continue to increase. It's just going to be at a smaller, but that's good. Like it's not, it, you can't keep it all together when you're, you know, doing 20% a year. Like you can't even keep up with that kind of growth. And so it's a good thing that you know that that appreciation is going to slow down. Um, first quarter 2022 GDP had a decline over fourth quarter, but fourth quarter was crazy hot. Um, we still have major issues with semiconductors. That's really what's hurting our supply. Um, and it, you know, it's funny in 2021 it was it was the demand surge, and so that's just why it's skewing all the numbers, and it's why I think the headlines are are a little negative. Um, but one interesting thing was our government spending our first quarter. It was one of the first times that they actually spent less on uh, goods and services, which is awesome. Um, but the you know we're going to have challenges this decade. <laughs> I'm not saying it's going to be rosy, it's going to be up, and it's going to be down, but overall the aggregate economy is actually doing pretty well. So now we'll go into U.S. Our debt is higher than it's ever been, and our taxes are lower um, than the national average. Um, it's kind of shocking to be, think about this, but you know, it's 60% tax rate is kind of the medium, and uh, we're at about 37%. Which means if you earned hundred dollars, the government would take sixty of the hundred dollars. Um, they're only taking about thirty-seven of our hundred dollars right now. But our deficit is so high, it doesn't make a lot of sense. We've got to either we have to close the gap somehow. That's either with taxes, changing taxes, whatnot. But we have to fill the gap. So prosperity in the age of decline. Uh, I've been talking about 2030 for since 2017. Uh, it's it's all these things: demographics, healthcare, entitlements, inflation, and the U.S. national debt. All of these things are not great, except our demographics in America are pretty good, which I will show you. Um, our U.S. industrial production. This is correct. So see this peak is going to be 2030, and then it's going to start declining. And what's going to end up happening between 2030 and 2040 is you're going to have a little, and then it's going to have a little bit of a dip up, and everybody's going to go, yay, we're getting out of it. No, and it's going to keep going down, and it's going to go up a little bit, and then it's going to keep going down. So in 2030, what you should have is one house for all of your friends and family to live in. You should have no debt, and you should be sitting in cash. Actually. We'll probably be in bonds by then. They'll be safe, and you'll be getting good interest on it. Uh, we should hit absolute bottom in 2036. Your plan should be to buy everything and get your hands on in 2036. This is percentage of total population in 2030, and why this is important is U.S. is actually doing something pretty good. Um, so under 20 is 23.7 percent of our population. The reason why these numbers are important is that each of these numbers buy the next age group's products. So kids under 20 are going to end up buying the people between 20 and 39, their stuff. So right now we're at 21.4. Our millennials are 23.6. Our Xers and boomers are 37.9. Our over 65 is 17. Oh, no. My bad. I was at China. Under 20, 23.7, then we go to 26.2, then we go to 29.5, and then we go to 20.6. Those are great numbers. China, you look at it, 21, 23, up to 37. China's going to have a huge gap to fill because they're going to have a bunch of products for this age group, and they're, they're, they're going to have a much longer recession than America will. Same with Germany, too large of a gap. Russia, way too large of a gap. Uh, Japan and China and Canada are all in the same boat. They did not prepare properly 
to make sure their population was consistent, and you're going to end up having basically supply issues. U.S. government long-term bonds. I mean, if you look at this, 2030 is going to be a high point. Um, they're only saying 5%. Right now, you can do a U.S. Treasury bond. Um, each person in America, no matter how much money you make, you can buy a U.S. Treasury bond. It's only $10,000. It's pushing out about 9.8%. I think it's a great investment every year. Uh, you buy it on the Treasury. You don't call your broker. But you're allowed to spend up to $10,000. So if you and your spouse or you, your spouse, or your child, but it's a great way to put some money away that's very safe, and that is actually producing for you. I bought. But you can only spend $10,000, so if you have a chunk of money, it's, it's a little bit, you know, but I mean, it's, it's a great option. Um, healthcare costs. Our health expenditures have beat our GDP, um, so orange is our GDP, our health expenditures are actually higher. So in 2020, 62 million Medicare recipients. By 2030, it'll be 80 million. This is going to be a big problem in America. We have to start deciding who gets health care and who doesn't at the end of the day. Just because you're breathing does not mean we should spend millions of dollars just to keep you breathing. And at some point, we have got to come up with a quality of life and let people die easily and without pain, but not funneling in money. I uh, was screaming at another like six weeks ago. Uh, my dad had a massive stroke in January of 2019. She drove him to the... She drove him to an eye doctor, which is hysterical because I'm married to an eye doctor, um, to get his eyes tested. Why? Like, his quality of life is completely horrific. We should not be spending money on his eyesight. He literally was supposed to die in 2019. It's 2022, but our medical system is basically keeping him breathing. Our tax dollars have spent millions on my dad, and his quality of life sucks. And I wouldn't want you to spend millions of dollars on me if my quality of life sucked. Entitlements. So, current transfer payments. This was all the, the money. You know, everybody was receiving checks, and everybody was really excited about the checks, and it was supposed to help because people weren't able to work, and now we're all paying for it, right? Paying for it at pump, paying at stores. Um, Interest payments are starting to rise. Uh, current, this is all federal government receipts and payments. Um, so basically our transfer payments are way up, our consumption is going up, um, our tax receipts are going up. Everything's increasing quite a bit. Um, you can really see it, uh, I mean, they're all a little bit, this is your like balance of, of all the lines. But I mean, it really kind of started in 2009 and it's just kind of continued. Inflation. Oh, fun word. <laughs> um, so, I mean, it, unless you live in a box, you know that we've had a lot of inflation. Um, this is our US dollar uh, weighted exchange rate um, to our deficit. So, Three month moving average is the blue line, and then our normal deficits here. Our deficit actually is going down a little bit, and so our our retail trade is actually going down a little bit, and that's exactly what we saw in the first quarter. Everybody went crazy fourth quarter of last year, and then this quarter we've all been a little more. We're we're just looking at everything, right? We're like, is everything going to get that high? We're buying things we know we're going to get higher. Um, but we're not spending like we did fourth quarter, which is good. The more money, you know, we, we need to keep spending money, but we also need to make sure that we're not at empty zero bank balances. Um, our, our, the weaker the U.S. dollar gets, the higher inflation, the stronger the U.S. dollar, the lower inflation. The great news is um, this is starting to come down. Our U.S. dollar is getting stronger because we raised interest rates. 
and the US dollar is improving, all of that is actually good for inflation. US median home prices continue to go up. I don't see that going down. I mean, it's always a little squiggle, right? But it's all still going up. Um, and, it, and it will be, uh, again, until 2030. Um, and with the dollar getting stronger, you would think that everything would go down a little bit, but things like food and oil, I don't see going down. Our consumer price index. This is our, this is really where we want to be. See this little blue line down? That was 2009. Y'all remember that? I was like, ouch. And then, so then we come up here and we're all going, and then this is 2030, and this is what it's going to be like. And I mean, it's, people are like, how can we have a decade um, recession? But if you look back uh, to the Dust Bowl in 1930, you absolutely did. And we're on a 100 year cycle. So, what's happening in Denver? Denver Metro, our demographics 76% um, white. Black, 9.24%. Other races, 6.13%. Uh, we're still pretty white. <laughs> we need more people of color coming here because they would be better. I mean, everybody's better with different ideas, different colors, different views, and it brings more, um, honestly, just production, I think, to America when you've got people from different uh, lives like coming together to create and build things. So this is just population by county. Um, we're sitting close to uh, 6 million people in Colorado still. Uh, it's really interesting when you, depending on what articles you read, uh, like there's an article going, you know, 15% of people are leaving Denver. The reality is, what happened was when COVID happened, people got nervous about condos, they got nervous about sharing doors, um, our suburbs did better than the inner city. Uh, however, now that people are feeling like they can leave and they can move forward and everything else, uh, the city's actually starting to improve. And the people much smarter than me believe that 98% of the U.S. population will live in major metropolitan cities by 2030. And the reason why is healthcare. Healthcare is getting so expensive, our rural places can't keep doctors. And if you look at our nurses, like our traveling nurses, they're making crazy money. I wish I was a traveling nurse. Like, you get to like, go travel somewhere. I mean, like, the money is wonderful. And so that's all something that's going to get, they're going to have to start controlling it because of the healthcare costs and expenses. And what they're going to do is they're going to go, okay, we're going to make sure that right here, Denver, we're going to have a really great state-of-the-art facility, and then it will be Fort Collins, and then it will be Colorado Springs, and they're not going to have little pockets all over. So when you end up having a health issue, um, you're not going to want to live in BFE. You're going to want to live where you can actually get to good health care quickly. Uh, we still have a few more men than women. We used to be men for, but we've balanced out pretty well. Go women. Um, from owners, so 71% of homeowners are married. 26.4% uh, of married people rent. Overall, we're 50-50, which means in all of Denver Metro, every time you meet somebody, there's 50% chance they rent, 50% chance they own. Colorado Key Facts. Uh, we contributed $64 billion um, to the overall uh, GDP. Uh, we have 511,000 jobs. This is Denver Metro. Uh, we have $21 billion in wages and salaries. That's for all of Colorado. We spent $37 billion. Good job. 92% um, of us are really into outdoor recreation. And Colorado does equate to 10% of the U.S. overall GDP. Denver's really interesting. Did you know, for all you Colorado people, 
that if you file your taxes by May 31st of 2022, you're going to get somewhere between four and eight hundred dollars in your mailbox. Doesn't matter how much money you make, doesn't matter who you are. Everybody's like, why is that so silly? Tabor was actually created in order to make sure the government didn't spend too much. We, some sectors have done better than other. I actually give Aurora a lot of credit. Aurora is really doing well from a deficit standpoint as far as their community and their city. So they have really contributed to Tabor. Um, Denver, not so much. Uh, you're going to be getting your check in the mail either August or at a minimum by September 15th. It's not a mistake. It's a good reason to do your taxes. Um, you'll, you'll get free money. Uh, that's about 3.1 million residents. That should tell you something else. And we have about 6 million people living in Colorado. 3.1 million are going to get Tabor <laughs> Repents. 50% of us are working. Or 50% of us are working and getting taxes. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so this is just Baker. So we do updates on all different neighborhoods. Tara's got her north neighborhoods. I've got my city neighborhoods. Um, this is a very good average. So this is quarter over quarter. So first quarter of 2021 to first quarter of 2022. Average default market 2021 were 36. This year is 17. The average close price was 511, 651 last year. This year it was 629, 439. Price per square foot was up from 4.48 to 5.47. That's 22.19 percent. Wow! Great for people that owned, not great for people who rent. The really tough thing about rentals is rentals follow real estate by 12 months. So if we had a 20 percent increase in real estate last year. They're going to feel that next year when they go to pay rent. So detached single family. This is still interesting. I mean, I think it's, it's well, April was a little bit higher. We had 4,616. Those are new listings. In June, we we're up to 5,658. Um, here's April. April went up and beat out this April slightly. And I truly believe because all the people that thought about selling are finally realizing that they missed the tip. If you wanted to make the most money on your property, you should have bought in March. Uh, same with attached single family. Uh, they were a little higher in 2021. So these are condos, townhomes, a little lower in 2022. That's all kind of supporting our raw active listing slide that we saw earlier, as far as there's just not as much supply. Um, this is just attached and detached. So if you look at everything, raw data, we were at 6,630 feet, five new listings, 6,881 new listings in April. They're just chasing. Medium closed prices. April 2021, 582. April 22, 684, 550 on average. Average close prices. <laughs> Detach is at 696. I don't know if you saw that article from uh, Westward. Average single family home in Denver Metro is now 825. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, we can go back to that. Everybody's like, how did anybody afford that? What's everybody thinking? Do you know what people in California pay? I mean, I'm not kidding. Like, you get a Cracker Jack box for $2 million in San Diego. So you've got to put it in perspective, right? $825 is a lot of money for a single family home in Denver Metro. But in the grand scheme of things, if you can't afford it, you probably shouldn't live in one of the greatest states in America. It's Geoflinger, we have great water, we have great air, we have a million things to do. Overall, it's fairly safe. It's a central place. It's, it's very, um, all I can say, if there's a nuclear bomb that goes off, I want to live in Colorado. I don't want to be on the coast. I don't want to be in Florida. I don't want to be in California. I want to be in Colorado. I want to be at a higher altitude. 
Um, and it's it's a smart investment. And I mean, compared to some of these other states, we're still affordable. And at the end of the day, everything has gotten so expensive that if everything were to burn down, it would cost more to build the house than 825. When you look at appliances, when you look at lumber, when you look at concrete, if you were literally to say, okay, I'm gonna tear this home down and I'm gonna rebuild it, it would cost you more than what you're giving the homes under contract for right now. Average days in the MLS. This is important, and this is one of the reasons why we're not in a housing bubble and why things are not going to crash down. If you look at average days in the MLS, Detached, so we were all up to 19 days in January. We're down to <laughs> nine, nine days. So that tells you it is still the seller's market. There are still um, not enough supply, and that's not going anywhere anytime soon. Um, these are our new listings. I do think it's interesting how, how much kind of went up. And it'll, it'll be interesting to see like May and June um, with interest rates increasing. But uh, June was the highest in 2021. I honestly, I mean, we're in May. I see us easily being at 7% interest rates by July. So um, if you have cash, great. If you're getting a loan, you need to really be talking with your lender and discussing what the options you have. And um, I'm actually, you know, Buying, I'm going to do an ARM. I'm not going to do a 30 year mortgage. Even though right now, 30 year mortgages, I think, are doing pretty well. They're a little bit better than ARMS. Um, so, but you really just need to sit down and make a plan because what you really you don't really need a 30 year mortgage. If everything's going to hit a brick wall in 2030, good as seven year. Right? Like, you'll be okay. Um, month in activity and month in closing of homes. So, um, Month end active listings and then month end closed. Our closed are actually higher than our active listings. So, how does that work? New construction is closing. Um, we, are, we are literally closing houses that was kind of beat out. They're actually like getting finished up. There's more closings than active listings in the market. So, our data snap. Shocked um, from a year ago. Let's see. Active listings are uh, month at month end up 23 percent. New listings are up 3.7 percent. Our closings are down 11.91 percent. There's less buyers because money's more expensive. Um, days in the MLS are down 38.46 percent. Um, and and. and that's one of the things I always watch is days on market. You know, before 2008, when it was January of 2007, I was looking at the numbers and I was like, huh, we felt like 27,000 active listings in Denver Metro. We were having about 5,000 closings a month. We had a huge gap. We had way more supply than actual people that were buying, and that was a big tail sign to me that what was what the precursor was and what was coming in the fall. And that's why I'm telling you, you do not need to be afraid. I mean, I think everybody should be gardening. I think you should be growing lettuce and tomatoes. Um, but I do not think you should be worried about buying a house. You're going to continue to have appreciation and it'll do well. So the 2030 depression, all the fun stuff. Food shortages, <laughs> woo, this is all the things we're gonna talk about. So here's the talk. I had lunch yesterday with a gal who just bought a house in the DU area and she's from Wyoming. She just got back from her parents' ranch. She said, mom, dad, what's going on? There's signs and all of their neighbors, all their neighboring ranches, are selling their ranches. One sold. Great. Guess what's happening? They're not farming. They're building developments. Farmers cannot afford to farm. Our water's gotten too expensive. Our grain is too expensive to feed our animals. 
and we're not farming correctly. So, and what I mean by that, if you haven't, because you know I've got to plug it. If you haven't watched Kiss the Ground on Netflix, you really need to to actually understand what's happening with food and our food issues in America. Kiss the Ground Netflix. Um, but we are going to have food shortages. Ukraine's, uh, you know, Russia's basically bombed out Ukraine. You know, Ukraine has fed so many countries, including China, Russia. Uh, they've, they've bombed it all. So the, uh, we will see a minimum of 12 million people die of starvation this year, globally. Minimum. What's it normally? Two? So it's, it's, it's going to be significant. You're not going to see people starving in America. You're going to see our food quality, if you haven't already noticed, going down. It's crap. They're feeding up our animals with hormones because they can't afford to feed them grain, and they can't afford to have land to have free pastures. Um, so you're going to see meat filled with crap. You're going to see veggies shipped from so many states away, by the time it gets here and you buy it and you put it on your kitchen counter, if you don't cook it in 24 hours, it's already crap. Um, we all need to take a little more stewardship over the environment and what you can do with your own backyard. Water shortages. Yay! Hey. More issues. So, in the next five years, we're going to see the hottest temperature record in America. Average summer in July in Arizona is 20, what, 123 degrees. Ugh. You have to live in AC in order to exist. Water is a big portion of that because water is kinetic energy and create, can help things. Colorado feeds five other states water. The good thing about water is they found pockets of water in the ocean, fresh water. Um, it's pretty amazing. They're figuring out that like miles and miles of fresh water floating in the Atlantic and the Pacific, which is great. We need technology to get there in order to harness that. But fresh water only represents 3% of the world. We need fresh water for animals. We need fresh water to live. Um, I, I'm thankful to be in a state that's powerful in water. I think people are crazy to be living in deserts with incredibly high temperatures, all you need is your, all you need is really the grid to go down. And you're dead. People are dying in India of the heat wave. People are dying in Pakistan over heat. I mean, just over heat. And I don't think, I think we read that and we're like, okay. But like, you really need to think about it. I mean, it's an issue. And you know, if you can't live in a natural environment, should you be buying homes there? I don't, I wouldn't. I don't think that's very smart. Um, and so, you know, Colorado's going to have to kind of figure out, am I going to give water to Colorado? Or am I going to feed Arizona and California and Utah? And, and so those are all options. Rising gas prices, it's not going to get better. It's going to get worse. Supply and demand. This is what it's all coming down to. It's just supply and demand. So some things we're going to do really well in. Some things we're not going to do so well in. Like used cars a couple months ago, you could get so much money for a used car. And now, not so much. And it's because chips have actually shown up and they're starting to produce cars again. And you're like, yay. And so it's, it literally just comes down to supply and demand. It's really general economics. You can almost tell anything with supply and demand. The reality is America continues to grow. We do not have a negative birth rate. Um, the, the, the People much smarter than me say globally uh, we can have 11 trillion people on this planet before we don't, don't, we can't keep that going. We're right now at 8 million. Um, so I, I continue to see more and more population. I think when you can hold hard assets right now, this is where you want to be. Um, so the fundamentals are watch what the government's spending, make sure you have three months liquid reserves. The number one thing you should do in order to build wealth in America is buy a primary home. The number two thing you should be doing, if your company offers 401k or IRA and does any matching, make sure you fill that up. The number three thing to build wealth is make sure you have three months of liquid reserves. Number four, any extra money that you have, I would throw into the S&P until you have enough money to buy an investment property. 
people in America that have one investment property retire 36 times more wealthy than people who do not. So the reality is, is everybody in the world needs housing and shelter. If you can provide that, great. This is back to Wyoming selling all their ranches. Biggest issue, who can tell me owns more farmland than anyone else in America? Nebraska. Bill Gates. Who? Bill Gates. Okay. Yes. Oh. Bill Gates owns more of our farmland than our government or any other farmer. And I don't know how much you know about Bill Gates, but that's something that you can ponder on this He's evening. They make meat. So, well, all, they also own all the potatoes, right? French fries, dogs. So, um, how do you prepare? How do you maximize the 2020s? And then how do you prepare for the 2030 depression? Think about it, it's only 2022. We still have seven and a half years before it's really going to start affecting us. So what you don't want to be is sitting in cash. Again, invest. I mean, if you have a house, awesome. Continue to pay your mortgage. Um, I think S&P you know, is on sale. Good quality stocks are on sale. Um, so you want to invest in more inflation hedged items. You want to stay involved in the equities market, S&P, but you want to exit before the depression. Um, live below your means. You know, really the secret to really truly building wealth is can you save 20% of your income? If you can save 20% of your income, you're going to be just fine. Pay down debt, um, you know, 401ks, mortgage rates are gonna just do nothing but rise over the next 10 years. Um, and uh, honestly, like, you know, if it's 2028 and you're thinking about buying, I wouldn't. I, I will not represent anybody starting 2028. I'm only going to be helping people with the day. So uh, what's going to do best in a recession? Um, single family homes are not immune to the effects of the depression, but they are going to do way better than condos. Single family homes are good because they don't have homeowners associations and things that other people can control and spend money and, and whatnot. You can really control more of your own home, how much watering you do, how much heat do you expend. Um, I would not suggest renting in 2030. I would still own my home, even in a great recession. I just am going to try to be as liberal as possible. Um, how long do I think it's going to last? I think it's going to be a 10-year period. Um, I think we'll hit our lowest point in 2036. Uh, obviously, you'll still want to come to Denveronomics, and we'll be watching it, because it could be a little bit earlier, but right now, uh, 2036 is the number that it looks like it's going to be for the, the bottom. And um, so let's say you're 50, 60, and 70, and you really want to be prepared, right? Health, finances, housing. You got to be debt free by 2030. You need to be cash, cash rich um, by the time we transition from the 2020s and 2030s. And just know that it's going to be a tumultuous decade. So you don't sell. When stocks are down, you sell when stocks are up. Don't sell anything when it's down. It will go back up. We've been, we're going to have this trend for another seven years. And that's it. That's Yay! 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 Yay!